of the Lord, friends, we give thanks for yet another opportunity to welcome you to worship as we worship God together virtually one more time. Come, come into this place where God listens and where you need no money, no status, and no fine clothes. Come as you are, broken, whole, sick, well, satisfied, or with deep needs. Come to sing, come to cry, come to hear, come to see, come and be ready, or come to be made ready. We are here, and God is here too. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for God is good and God's mercy endures forever.
Friends, it has been a great week of opportunities for us to gather together, to grab hands, and to go to God together. We hope to do as we did last week, beginning our week in prayer. Tuesday morning at 6 a.m., we hope that you'll come along that we might be able to grab hands together and intercede for our friends, our family, those who stand in the need of prayer. Wednesday at 7 p.m. we look forward to being able to deep dive into the Word again and we have had a great set of studies on, on these past few weeks. We look forward to continuing to break the bread of life open that we might then learn from God and get strength to meet every challenge. And on Thursday at 7 p.m., we look to gather again in prayer that we might be able to intercede one more time. Not everybody can make it on th Tuesday mornings at 6 a.m. We hope that you can come along with us Thursdays at 7 p.m. And this week, we're looking forward to getting with the men and working on our own spiritual formation. We are reading in Henry Nowen's book entitled Spiritual Formation on how it is we can get ourselves ready to meet the God that has been beseeching and searching and calling for us since we came into the world. We want to deepen our relationships, men, and we want to do that together. Why don't you come along with us 10 a.m. this coming Saturday. Contact me, pastor at BethlehemNewark.org. This week I'll make sure you have the reading and that you are prepared for our conversation. These are our announcements. We hope that you will come along with us, that we can have strength to meet every challenge and that we will learn more about the one who gives us grace in order to live in this world. Friends, we give thanks for God's great faithfulness, for that which God is providing to each and every one of us. And God only asks that we would be faithful in our giving back to God, that you would make sure that there's meat in God's house and that you would make sure that there are resources available to those who need some extra help. There are a couple of ways to give to Bethlehem, and we hope that you will use one of these to make sure that your tithes and your offerings find their way to us, that we might give to those who come with a need, that we might use resources to continue the operation of our ministry, and that we would then be able to help somebody who needs a little extra help. 
Whichever way you wish to give, we hope that you will choose one of these methods, either through the mail and the addresses on your screen, 587 Reverend Tony E. Jackson, Senior Way, Newark, New Jersey, 07107. Or perhaps you might give through the Givelify service, accessed on your mobile device, through the mobile app, or on our website, www.BethlehemNewark.org forward slash donate. Whichever way you wish to give, we want to be faithful with your gift and we shall be. We hope that you will be faithful and cheerful in your giving unto God. And to God be the glory. Amen. Beloved, there is a word from the Lord today that we are going to take from the 21st chapter of the book of Genesis, starting at the ninth verse. Genesis 21, beginning at the ninth verse. And we will read from the Message Bible, wherein we find these words. One day, Sarah saw the son that Hagar, the Egyptian, had borne to Abraham, poking fun at her son, Isaac. She told Abraham, get rid of this slave woman and her son. No child of this slave is going to share inheritance with my son Isaac. The matter gave great pain to Abraham. After all, Ishmael was his son. But God spoke to Abraham, don't feel badly about the boy and your maid. Do whatever Sarah tells you. Your descendants will come through Isaac. Regarding your maid son, be assured that I'll also develop a great nation from him. He's your son too. Abraham got up early the next morning, got some food together and a canteen of water for Hagar, put them on her back and sent her away with the child. And she wandered off into the desert of Beersheba. When the water was gone, she left the child under a shrub, went off 50 yards or so, she said, I can't watch my son die. As she sat, she broke into sobs. Meanwhile, God heard the boy crying. The angel of the Lord came, called from heaven to Hagar. What's wrong, Hagar? Don't be afraid. God has heard the boy and knows the fix he's in. Up now, go get the boy. Hold him tight. I'm going to make of him a great nation. Just then, God opened her eyes. She looked. She saw a well of water. She went to it and filled her canteen and gave the boy a long, cool drink. God was on the boy's side as he grew up. He lived out in the desert and became a skilled archer. He lived in the parent wilderness, and his mother got him a wife from Egypt. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be unto God.
Please join me in assuming a posture of prayer. Dear God, we thank you for this moment and for that which you wish to share with us. We ask God that you will prepare our hearts that we might receive all that you are saying. We wanna have a new experience today, God. We ask that you would lead us, that you would guide us, that you would open us, that you would fill us, that you would make it so we hear what you are saying and help us, God, to run from wherever we are and hasten to do the work you're calling us to do. Help us to make this word a part of us, that we might be able to use it to your glory. May the words of this preacher's mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. These are familiar characters in these texts that we find in Genesis 21 and, of course, in Genesis 16. We're dealing with Abram, Sarai, and Abraham, and Sarah, and, of course, Hagar and her son, Ishmael. There's a promise that God makes to Abram and tells him what is going to happen, and that he's going to have descendants that are countless, that are as numerous as the stars in the sky. And they have a problem believing that this is going to happen between Abram and Sarai. And Sarai tells Abram, Abram, why don't you go into my servant girl? Uh, some translations say maid, but this is a slave. This woman is enslaved by Abram and Sarai, and her name is Hagar. Hagar is an Egyptian. Hagar is a daughter of the African continent. Hagar is one who is now in this place as enslaved by these people who are going to deny her humanity, who are going to, with some legalistic justifications, make it so that she has no choice in the matter and the decision that is about to be made for her. And Abram goes in and is now treating her, some texts say, as a wife, but basically she is made to be a means of production. She is made to be a means of giving Sarai what Sarai wants. Sarai wants a child. Sarai is an old woman and she wants a child. And she tells Abram, who is all too willing, who is all too glad, who is all too able to follow directions and to go into Hagar's place and make Hagar pregnant. Well, it happens. It happens that she becomes and she conceives, she becomes pregnant. And you know the story, Hagar runs away when it is seen that she does have contempt for her female oppressor. Her male oppressor, uh, it doesn't say she has contempt for him, but she has contempt for Sarai. Sarai cannot have this enslaved woman having status like she does and makes life hard for Hagar. Hagar runs away. And God tells Hagar, listen, you need to go back. I'm gonna bless this child that you have. And I heard your cry. I've seen you. I've paid heed to you. You're going to call this boy's name Ishmael. But I've paid heed to your cry. And Hagar then names God and says, Is this the God who sees me and yet I live? Now we have this woman who goes back into enslavement and she bears she gives birth to this child unto Abraham, uh, Abram, and, and, and the child is named Ishmael. And now, now we see that in the 21st chapter, Hagar uh, uh, has this child, Ishmael, who is now 13, 14 years old. And Sarah, now that her name has changed, Sarah has her own child, Isaac. Now there is a situation here. 
And one day when Ishmael is playing with his younger brother, uh, laughing and, 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 and doing the thing that he is doing with this child that is his half-brother, we have a problem in Sarah's eyes. She says, this child of the slave girl, of the enslaved woman, will not share the inheritance. Of course, you know, the, 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 there, are, there are those things that happen even in these cases where the older child is to receive the double portion of the inheritance. But that would mean, as we find in certain commentaries leaning on Dolores S. Williams and Sisters in the Wilderness, that might mean that Hagar now could have higher status than Sarah. Oh, this cannot be. This, as they say in Proverbs, is one of the four things that shake up the earth for an enslaved person to have status over the mistress. This cannot be. And Sarah tells Abraham, you got to get this enslaved woman and her child out of here because she is not going to share in any of this inheritance. I am not going to let my slave girl be equal to or better than me. She goes off into the desert with a skin, as some translations say, a canteen and a little food to take with her that doesn't last but so very long. Abraham, the text says, is broken up a little bit about this, but gives Hagar a little bit of food and some water and says, all right, now you've got to go. You are expelled. Be on your way. You and this boy go. And they go. And we get to the point with Hagar that now she is unable to even deal with the fact that she knows that she's going to die. There is no place else for her to go. And her son, she, she sits her son down, uh, some translations say a bow shot away, 50 yards or whatever the distance is so that she doesn't have to face the thing that she fears is going to happen. Nay, she knows this is going to happen. This boy is going to die. What mother wants to see that? What mother wants to know that? What parent wants to see that child die? God's angel calls down from heaven. Uh, some translations and commentaries say this is God, God's self. God's angel calls down from heaven and says, what's wrong, Hagar? Before Hagar can have a chance to respond, God says, don't be afraid. God has heard the boy and knows the fix he's in. And God shows up in this moment and gives them a way of escape. Here is a very interesting text, one that we can sink our teeth into. It gives us some things that we can deal with with respect to notions of surrogacy and notions of agency and lack thereof and notions of how black women and their wombs were taken over in the antebellum South and used as modes of economic production, wherein the people who were children of these uh, 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 rapes, these children of these sexual assaults, these children of these encounters between the enslaver and the enslaved were often left without any of the inheritance that ought to be provided to children. And, and there was no compensation, clearly, for the denial and the rejection and the indignity, the, the sheer uh, uh, lack of respect for the human that was done in the way of these sexual violences, in the way of breaking up the families that were, that were created in such heinous ways. And here we have a situation where black women of this generation and earlier generations can look back to Hagar and say, I identify with this woman. I identify with this woman who was a child of the African continent, a black woman who is dealing with some things in this ancient, ancient story. And yet God heard her and God answered her and God saw her situation and paid heed and said, you'll call the boy Ishmael. God showed up later on with this teenage boy, perhaps who was 16 years old. Some calculations may go when they leave and are cast out of this house of Abraham and Sarah 
and 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 we are still dealing with a God who eventually shows up. We celebrate that God heard Ishmael and underscoring the very name and, and nature of this boy, and, and, and we we give we give thought to the fact that 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 Abraham had done some things as Abram that he ought not have done. But God paid heed in chapter 16 to the impregnated Hagar and sent her back to where she might be able to be, uh, to live, to have people deal with her and help her while she's incapacitated in the midst of, of, sla of, of her pregnancy. Uh, and she returned to her enslavement. And then she, he, God is also seeing and acting on behalf of the born child Ishmael. Clear in this text that Hagar had resigned herself to giving up in chapter 21 after she's cast out and has eaten all of the food with Ishmael and has had all of the water with Ishmael and, and they don't have resources to continue to live. Ishmael is his own person, but also perhaps Ishmael is, is a burden. Ishmael represents something that she can no longer face. What do we do with the pain when we can no longer face it? What do we do when we consider the ways that we're powerless to, to, to ease the pain of our loved ones? How do we hide our face from that? What do we do when we accuse ourselves of playing a part in someone else's pain? We don't know the conditions of of Hagar's enslavement. We don't know why she or how she's come to be with them, but we we do know uh, 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 perhaps that, that now that she is with this family and in this enslavement that God, after Hagar leaves, sends her back. And she's sent back and she has this child and the child grows to 13 years old by the time Isaac comes along. And maybe by the time that Sarah has weaned uh, 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 Isaac off of her, her uh, off, off of the breastfeeding regimen and Ishmael is a teenager of 13 or 14 and then 16 years old, maybe 17, what do we do? If, if Hagar is in the desert and thinking about the fact the last time I was here, God sent me back to that agony. God sent me back to that slavery. God sent me back to be mistreated and maligned, to be denigrated and dishumanized, to be sought and to be made fun of, to be shown that I am only a beast of burden. Here I am in this situation and I, I had this trust in God and now what am I to do now in this situation? What is Hagar saying to herself as she has put her child off a little ways and, and is dealing with her own pain? God, as God says, I hear the boy, it is also Hagar who's crying, who's crying out in her agony, who's crying out in her pain who's crying out of a situation, who's crying out looking to find some way. God, maybe you could just take me. Perhaps she's saying, what is Hagar saying? Wherever she is, what is she thinking? How is she dealing? Well, she sat the boy down and then she sat in her pain and she cried. God gave her a prophecy, but I don't know if she continued to think about the prophecy. How, how do we consider what these people are saying in their cries? It makes us wonder, do you hear their cries, God? Do you hear their cries, God? How, how many enslaved mothers cried out for their children? How many enslaved parents cried out for their children? How many mothers 
in Flint, Michigan are crying out for their children and have for years because they don't have clean water. How many mothers in poverty are crying out for their children because they, they don't eat on a regular basis. In COVID times, perhaps their children don't even go to school every day. There's no broadband in the house. Their social connections have broken down. Their kids are despondent and not doing well in school if they're engaged in school at all. How many mothers are crying? How many mothers are crying in poverty? How many mothers who have lost their jobs are wondering how they will make it tomorrow or when the eviction moratorium runs out? What are they going to do? How many of us, God, are crying out? How many of our children are crying out? How many of our children are crying out, God, who are addicted to drugs or addicted to sex or unfamiliar with what love actually looks like and will settle for whatever reasonable and unreasonable facsimile comes along? How many of our children are crying out because they're hungry, because they're struggling for clean air and clean water, can't eat and drink and even breathe good because of asthma and other situations? How many folk are crying out because they're living in their car? How many parents are crying out or how many children are crying out too because their parents have thrown them out of the house because their children came out of the closet? And how many children are crying out because they have no place to live and are living on the streets? Don't know what types of work that they've got to get into in order to survive. And how many people are crying out because they have to not only be surrogates, but have to throw themselves into sex work. Because that's the only thing that can make a little money so that they can have something in their belly. God, do you hear their cries? Do you hear their cries, God? Will you pay heed? Will God, you, will you put an end to the slavery that these people are in? Or are you going to send them back for 12 or 13 or 14 more years? The text offers us a message, a vision of a way that God can intercede and to interrupt the process that God interrupts the natural process. They are going to starve. They are going to die of dehydration. They are going to perish for not having enough resources. They can go no further. And God interrupts that process and says, God has heard the boy and knows the fix he's in. And then he acts and he opens up. Hagar's eyes and she can see a well a little ways off and gives him a drink of cool water. How many of you know when you are dry and parched and having a hand what you need for so long? A drink of cool water, whether it's water or it's love or it is shelter or it is some other resource that you must have in order to live. You drink that up and it is the most wonderful thing that you could ever, ever put in your body or have in your situation. God makes a way out of no way. Do you hear their cries, God? As children play outside, do you hear their cries, God? Well, in my lived experience as I've walked with God and in God, there, there have been times where I felt like, hey God, where I felt like giving up. Maybe you've been there too, you felt like giving up. Maybe, maybe you've done like me, you actually did give up. Oh, I was not in the wilderness about to die with my child and about to throw up my hands and give up as far as us going unto death. But there have been situations that have been seemingly insurmountable. And rather than continue on through the crucible, I have said I can't do any more, God. I can't go any further. I got to stop here. Do you hear their cries, God? God heard my cry. I sat down in my problems with all I could face and said, I can't even look at it anymore. I can't even deal with it. I sat it off in a distance and said, I'm just going to keep on keeping in my own situation, wallow right here in this set of problems and cry out, 
hoping, hoping that something may happen or that God could just end the situation. Maybe you've been there, maybe you haven't, but if you have and you are going through, I've got a little advice for you. It's twofold. Number one, on this first Sunday after we have celebrated the resurrection of Jesus the Christ, I want to say, you know, you've got to remember the love ethic of Jesus. Love somebody, treat them like you would want to be treated. Treat people as if they are ends and not means, that classic test of deontology. Treat people like they are ends, like they are not a means to your own selfish end for pleasure or for whatever situation that you desire. You want to treat folk as if they are worthy of their own treatment as an end unto themselves, just like you would want to be treated. Let me tell you a little something about that. Abram didn't have to rape Hagar. Abram didn't have to listen to Sarai and go into the tent. Abram should have, could have said, you know what? I'm just going to trust God. And not only am I going to trust God, I am going to love this person and treat them like a human. You don't have to do everything that you have power to do just because it can make your situation better. Sometimes you've got to sit down in your problem and just wait. Sometimes you've got to sit down in your situation and say, I'm going to love somebody. Matter of fact, how is it possible for me in this time to see how I am Hagaring somebody, allowing the laws and the policies and the public associations and arrangements of the day to let me dehumanize somebody, to let me denigrate somebody, to let me put somebody down, to be complicit in their oppression just because society says, that's okay. You can do that. It's all right to do that. It's like Richard Pryor's uh, skit where he says, can you break an N-word? Yeah, yeah, right there. You can, you, can, you can do this with two police who are trying to subdue somebody and they put on a chokehold and he dies. Can you do that? Yes, you can do that just because you can. Doesn't mean you should. We ought to use our power to love somebody. But when people don't matter, when lives of the people don't matter, when, 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 when there are big eyes and little U's, and when you can see that people who, you know, you got your kind of people and then there's a lower kind of people, when you're looking at folks as if there is a second class, there is a lower caste, there is a subjugated caste, then you can say, oh, I'll do them like I want to do them, but Jesus didn't just come and spend time with us on the earth and get up on that cross and give up the ghost and rise on the third day just so we could have a home in the great hereafter. Oh yes, there is a place for us when we cross the Jordan. But you got to go across the Jordan having done for right. Otherwise, did you really believe that Jesus was who Jesus said Jesus was? If you can't love nobody, is it really for you to inherit the kingdom of heaven? This is seen so easily now in how COVID has ravaged our civilization, our society, our nation, uh, our communities. We see just how few people, how, or just how many people have not been cared about. Just how many people are throwaway people. Just how many people, we don't care about their cries. We didn't care about their cries before. COVID is not the great equalizer. COVID is the inequity catalyzer. COVID makes things that, that were, accelerates inequity, accelerates the big eyes and the little U's. It has created more wealth for the wealthy and more poverty for the poor. And here we are in a situation on the first Sunday after the resurrection. And we just have to own up to the fact that if we want to keep people out of the Hagar position, we've got to love somebody. Do you hear their cries, God? Yes, God hears their cries and has told us the certain things you've got to do, the certain way you've got to live right now, right now. Because the more people, you can blame Abraham, the more people, you can blame Sarah. 
But the more people, the greater the number of people who don't love somebody now, the more you will have Hagar's later crying out in impossible situations and waiting and waiting and waiting to die. Here's a second point that we have to go over, that we have to understand in the midst of this story that God is sovereign. God is free. God is powerful. But God chooses when and how to show up because God is sovereign. I've cried and you've cried and some of us are crying out right now. God, do you hear their cries? Do you hear us now in our agony, in our trouble, in our hurt, in our addiction, in our lovelessness, in our loneliness, in our evil, in our pain, in our acting out, in our insurmountable odds? God, do you hear what we are crying out for? Can you hear us, God? Do you know what it is we're going through? The question isn't, does God hear? God heard you. God heard what you were going through. God saw what you were dealing with. The question is, is God going to move on our behalf? Is God going to pay heed to us? Is God going to interrupt the process? Is God going to stop the death? Is God going to revive us? Is God going to give us a way of escape? And is it going to be, this is what you really want, is it going to be satisfactory? Is it going to be what I want? Is it going to be a beautiful white Tesla in my yard? Is it going to be a brand new house with a two-car garage? Is it going to be the, the choice of where I want to eat for dinner every night of the week? Is it going to be my choice of vacations? Is it going to be what I want, whatever it is you want? Well, you know what you want. Is it going to be that? Is it going to be survival? Is it going to be paying my student loans? Is it going to be covering the mortgage next month? I don't know what it is you're crying about. I know this, when I was crying out to God, when I was looking for God to move on my behalf, when I wanted an end to the pain, when I wasn't making enough money, when I had to do some extra jobs, when I had to do some things, God said, this is what you need to do. And just be patient until it's time. God gave me a little word, gave me some encouragement, but told me you might have to let some of that pride go. I know you got a master's degree. You may have to do some things you didn't plan to do. I know that you are a Morehouse man. You may have to be some places that you didn't think that you were going to have to go because the times are tough and the things are rough, but you can't give up now and you can't not face the situation. Oh, I hear you. And I see you, and I'm about to move, but God chooses when that time is. God chooses when the time comes that your agony ends. God chooses, and God may need for you to go through for 12 or 13 or 14 years. God may need for you to deal with the situation and the pain and the suffering. God may need to do something in you in the midst of the pain and the suffering and give you an experience or give you something that's going to allow you to be able to make it in the next place that God takes you. What does it mean? What does it mean for somebody to live in the wilderness and set that child off a bow shot away and then that child grow to be an expert bowman and then them be able to live in the wilderness in their ability to sustain themselves based upon what God may have taught them in those moments of agony. What does it mean for God to use the thing that you thought was going to kill you to allow you to continue to move forward in life ways you never thought that you were going to be able to? What, is it, what does it mean for God to use the thing that you thought was going to kill you as a place of thriving? How can you thrive in the environment where you were formerly suffering? Only God knows how to transform that situation into such a thing. But if you're going through hell, as uh, I don't know who said it, I don't know where I heard this from. Maybe it was the title of a book. Maybe it's just 
a very nice thing to say. When you're going through hell, whatever you do, don't stop going. Just move on through the situation. Sometimes God hasn't called for an end to your pain. Get all you can. Ask God for wisdom. Tell God, I don't know what you want from me here. Help me to get all that I'm supposed to get. I don't want to repeat this. Help me to get all I'm supposed to get. Maybe somebody can be blessed because I can tell the story. Help me to get all I'm supposed to get. God, I'm crying out. I want an end. Do you hear my cry? Yes. God says, I hear you. But here's what I need for you to do. I give thanks to a God who knows my situation, who sees me where I am, who hears my cry, and who cooperates, or rather offers me the opportunity to cooperate with God for God's own purpose, in God's own timing, in God's own way, and to God. Not every story may give us comfort because even though it worked for Ishmael and Hagar, we know that many people suffered unto death. In the lived experience of my ancestors, we know that some people were, were heard, but perhaps their lot was not to have the cool drink at the end of the narrative. God chooses these ends for God's own purpose in God's own way. But thanks be to God that there is a God who sees us and hears us and has a plan for our lives. I don't know what God's plan is for you. And I guess, to be honest, I'm still learning and working out what God's plan is for me. But I rest and am assured that God indeed has a plan. In whichever way that plan works out in your life, for you to make it from your valley experience, from your wilderness experience, to the peaks and the in-betweens, you need to have a conversation. You need to be in an ongoing conversation with God. Oh, everything ain't going to be all peaches and cream. Life is not going to be like you want it every day. No matter what they say on Instagram, no matter what you hear on television, no matter what you see in the movie, there's going to be some pain and some suffering. Can you be hashtag blessed in your wilderness experience, not knowing if this is the very end? Can you be hashtag blessed in your valley low experience when you don't know which way to turn? You don't know what's, which end is up. So you have to stick close to the God who leads and guides you to know which way to go. We offer today the opportunity to get closer to the one who is still looking for you and wants to fit you neatly into the place that has been designed for you since the foundations of the world. God knows your name and your situation. Whosoever will. Whosoever will, will choose salvation in the world to come and the opportunity to live a liberated life in the world we're in. We offer this opportunity to come close to God in the one they call Jesus, the Christ, the risen Savior, who loves, leads, and guides us into a way of being that again offers salvation in the world to come and salvation in the world we're in. Liberation in this time. Pray with me. Gracious God, we give you thanks for that that you have made possible for us. We ask that you would cover us, clean us, lead us, and guide us. Help us, God, where we need to accept. Help us to say we accept the risen Savior, 
and know that you are the one who opens the door to God. We ask God that you would help us in this moment that we might get closer, that we might become more mature, that we might learn how to get through and from challenge to challenge, situation to situation, faith to faith, be able to live up in the kingdom of God as the people you're calling us to be. O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer, we pray. Amen and amen. Beloved, we offer the opportunity to pray with you. We offer the opportunity to help you as you go on your Christian journey. We are all journeying together, not having arrived in our Christianity, not having arrived in our Christianness, not luxuriating in any perceived thoughts of holiness. We are simply sinners saved by grace. And we want to help each other and we want to help you too to live the life that God is choosing for you, hoping that you will choose it too. Oh, it's a choice. You cannot do it if you don't want to. And we hope that you will. Again, we're going to gather this week. We invite you to come along with us. We invite you to share the message with other people. We invite you to check out our website and our Facebook page. And we hope that we have the opportunity to come back together and worship with you again. But until we have that chance to gather one more time, I hope that you will receive this benediction. And now unto the one who is able to keep us from falling and present us faultless before God's glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power. Christ, now and evermore. And the people of God said, Amen and Amen. Go in peace, beloved, and may the peace of God go with you. So oh.